<laughs> what? Why would you throw this at me on Reddit? And there was this live stream feature. I was like, oh, cool, live stream my practice. 30,000 people on that live stream at one point. I was like, what is going on? I was sat there in my pyjamas. <laughs> yeah, like people were literally getting into wars over you. And, I, and it's, what, why, why do you think that is? Um, don't just learn the pentatonic scale. Actually learn how to phrase with it. Oh, she's having a go at me now. <laughs> no, no, no. Everyone just thought I was kind of a bit of a weirdo for playing electric guitar and uh, liking like Steve Ray Vaughan and stuff. And then suddenly, like overnight, it was actually cool. This video that I did for you just blew up, didn't it? And yeah, people it's crazy. loved it. That video has probably accumulated up to like 10 million views on all platforms. So it's gone super crazy. Sorry to say this, but a lot of you are stuck in your old ways. <laughs> oh. And uh, I actually don't appreciate it. So would you buy like a Gibson, for example? No. <laughs> okay, no, no comment. <laughs> Try to throw me into an existential crisis. <laughs> yeah. Yellow. Yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Yellow. Yellow. This is it. This is it. Now, are we are we rolling? We're rolling. Okay. okay. Hey guys, welcome to the very very first pedal porn podcast. We have. Uh, I can attest to saying this after spending a good seven days with Mimi. She's one of the coolest people on the planet. We're here with the one and only Mimi Sounds. Let's go. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. No, it's cool. It's all cool. Um, I'm sure you guys probably know who Mimi is. If you don't, you've been literally living under a rock because you can't go on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube without seeing her. She, Everything she posts blows up, everything. So um, that's probably a good way. That, I feel like there's a few ways I was going to try and start this podcast, but I feel like the best way to do it is to actually talk about how we met and the viral video that it did help blow pedal porn up as well because um, do you want to just talk about the video? Yeah, so... Um... It's kind of weird because I'd already like, I'd already started kind of doing videos for quite a while by that point, like maybe uh, a year. I don't know. Yeah. And I I always put like so much effort into these videos and like the recordings and making sure it's mic'd up and all proper. But this video that I did for you, um, I didn't even know your company at this point properly. It was actually one of my friends in London who just gave me one of your pedals. And he was like, yeah, it's super cool. Check it out. And I was like, I will. And I loved it so much that I was like, I'm just going to do a little video because I think my audience will love this as well. And uh, like, I, I didn't mic it up. I didn't do anything like that. It was just kind of super chill. This is how it sounds. This is how the guitar sounds without it. This is how it sounds with it. And the video just blew up, didn't it? Yeah, and people it's crazy. loved it. I was kind of blown away because I was like, I put all this effort into my other videos and then like the one video that I just don't even bother miking it or anything, it just goes crazy. For sure. I feel like that's, there's sometimes like a direct inverse correlation with how much time you put into something and how well it does. Because if I spend four days on a video, it'll get one view. But if I spend like five minutes, it'll go viral. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's so annoying. But um, that video has probably accumulated up to like 10 million views on all platforms. So it's gone super crazy and... Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I didn't actually know who he was. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. But, but I think you tagged us in that post and I was like, who is this girl? Because like, it just went mental and the playing was crazy. More importantly, forget the tone, the playing was crazy. And that sort of, you know, letting itself into future opportunities that we've now gone on to collaborate with. Like we um, then were proud to sponsor you to go to Nam. Yeah. So that was like always been a dream for you, hasn't it, since you've been like younger? Like um, what, what, why, why did you want to go to go to Nam? Um, I've always watched guitar YouTube and I've seen, I've heard people talking about Nam and I've seen a few videos and it just seemed like, and I also it's in like, well, it's in Anaheim, which is next to LA kind of thing. And it just seemed like something I really wanted to go to. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we were at the point in our like relationship, um, where you were like, oh yeah, just let us know like if, if we can do anything for you. Yeah. And I was like, well... Actually, yeah. I've got a few, I've got a list, <laughs> a list prepared. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, but that was no, that was great. Like we were proud to do that, and um, you smashed it when you went over there. Literally, the first night, you know, I, hope, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but Mimi texted me, and she was literally at like the top party where every YouTuber goes, and it's like there was everyone there, and it's like Mimi just got in. She managed to, <laughs> you know, finesse her way into it straight away. So, so who who did you meet when you was over there? At the party thing. Yeah, yeah, just overall in like oh. in Nam, like LA. Um. When I, my first day of Nam, I actually went to the Bad Cat booth 
Uh, they do amplifiers if you haven't heard of them. And uh, that was probably my favourite part of the actual NAM show because they invited me to like try out their amps and play at their booth. And I think that's the start of this kind of great relationship we have going because I just love what they're doing so much. And uh, we've actually, uh, we've been working on some stuff behind the scenes and uh, we're going to be allowed to share that literally in like a week. Nice. So probably by the time this has come out, it's out. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that you had the chance to meet one of your childhood heroes over there? Yeah, so uh, Tim Pierce was... um, a session he was doing like session work in the 80s and the 90s and um he's, I play, always, played, on, he's, sorry, he's, he's played on everything hasn't he he's yeah, played yeah, if you yeah. google his like wikipedia page he's played on like michael jackson's records like um i don't know like just fuck, like anyone. anyone you can think Any, of. anyone yeah yeah he's there <laughs> i met him at the party that was great honestly it was so weird to like see him in person you know yeah and um and then we did a video together. We did a kind of a track and uh, I got to learn, like, I got to actually see one of the best session players kind of in action, which was really cool. That's amazing. <laughs> Can I just get some water? Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it got so hot. <laughs> yeah, it's like the pressure, like four lights on you. Talking about, like, Jesus. <laughs> I'm my heroes. With Tim Pierce, he's sort of gone on to be almost like a mentor to you, hasn't he now? He's, he's like a, a guy that you can go to to trust and he's very much taking you under his wing to like show you tips and just be there if you need any any help yeah like any i've hit him up about like some gear things recently just like yeah i've got some pedals that i'm eyeing out and i'm like because I'm, I'm really searching for that um 80s tone recently i've just totally fallen in love with it and i'm yeah. like what better person to ask than the man himself yeah totally yeah, yeah. <laughs> i feel like a lot of people online are trying to be like a guitar virtuoso mm. you are you, you're going down like quite a unique path and you're trying to actually forge a career as a um, session player. Yeah. And that's almost like your ultimate dream, isn't it? Why do you lean towards wanting to be a session player? I think when I started out, the idea of like doing a show looked really cool. Like I first saw Jimi Hendrix, um, just a video of him doing Video Child and that's kind of what started my like guitar playing. And uh, we actually had a pretty cool studio at my school um, like it was a performing arts school, so we kind of that was kind of like one of the main facilities. I just so much more preferred being in the studio, and I just thought it was so cool. And um, I've also studied uh, like uh, audio engineering kind of thing. Like I'm not that's not like my preferred avenue. Like I much prefer like playing music and playing guitar, but I just find it so much more interesting. Um, I'm not saying like I would exclude live playing altogether. I definitely think I want to do that in the future, but. Yeah, being in the studio and just making songs and crafting all the parts, that's always really appealed to me. Um, I've kind of had gear throughout the years where I've tried to do it at home. And uh, one of my newest friends actually in London that I met when I moved, like been there for like a year now, uh, he's got a super cool home studio. He has this uh, synth called a Juno 106. Right, yeah. I've been dreaming about that for so many years and I finally got to play one when Whoa, he was like, yeah, cool. come to my studio. Yeah, that was I noticed even last night we was listening to some uh, tracks that were like the radio and then you was like, listen to that synth. You sort of picked out the synth and I was like, that's an obscure <laughs> thing to pick out. But yeah, yeah that's... I, just, I get excited about things like that. Yeah. I remember seeing a video of yours on YouTube that, I think it was Castles Made of Sand Mm -hmm. and it had like 18 million views or something. It was like insane. I feel like, I I think you've since deleted that video actually, but um, yeah, that just blew up. Was that one of the first moments where you thought, actually, this is going to be a a viable career to be a YouTuber? Um, I think so. The the strange thing is actually, like I started out on just Instagram. Yeah. So I think I'd already posted that video on Instagram uh, along with a few others and then... Uh, I just posted a few on YouTube, but it was kind of like a, just for the hell of it thing. Like nobody would, like all my followers or people who enjoyed what I did were on an ins- on Instagram. I was like, I'll just do it on YouTube anyways. And uh, I, I kind of just uploaded it, then left it. And when I checked back, like maybe a week or two later, they would like, they had like exploded. Right, yeah, yeah. I was like, what the? <laughs> to, to be honest, your growth is like literally meteoric. Like you, you went from like zero to you know, hundreds and thousands of subscribers in, in a year, didn't you? 
It was like, yeah. probably, was it from like zero to 500,000 in a year or something like that? Something like that, yeah. Which is, if anyone knows anything about YouTube, that's hard to do. <laughs> and you just smash it straight away off the bat. So you went super viral and like, what, what was it like to just go super viral? Because I know you've, we've had chats off camera where, you know, throughout your teen years and stuff, you've been a bit more reserved and not had too much attention on you. But to go from that to suddenly like being, you know, yeah. absolutely blowing up, it must be quite an experience. Yeah, oh my God. Uh, I was just, everyone just thought I was kind of a bit of a weirdo for playing electric guitar and uh, liking like Steve Ray Vaughan and stuff. And then suddenly, like overnight, it was actually cool. Yeah. Um, That was a really strange experience for me because I, I was just like, wait, why are people enjoying this? Yeah. Like, <laughs> doesn't feel right, does it? <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, obviously, I was really happy that people were. It was just kind of like a mindset shift for me. Yeah, totally. I, I, I sort of relate to that. Um, being like an out like a black sheep of the family or whatever because I I've always been the same and like, like I said to you off camera like I was even on my prom night I was sat there just playing Steve Ray Vaughan in a dark room and like all my friends were like out trying to whatever and it's just like I've always been the same and then yeah so it's to have attention on you now is it I I sort of can not relate to it in the same level as yours but I do feel the same did you want to actually become a YouTuber No I never really had any aspirations to be a YouTuber when I was a teenager um but i think i'm enjoying i like i just kept on doing it because i was enjoying it yeah um so even though i never like really dreamed of doing it it's like it's been amazing to me and uh it's part it's like the further my music career goes i have no plans of stopping youtube or anything i just think it's so fun to do as like kind of a documentation of whatever i'm working on or gear that i'm buying or just uh, dialing in tones or things like that. Totally, I feel, I feel like that's why um, so many people have sort of like fallen in love with you on YouTube. It's like you you are literally just vlogging your life, and you're so authentic with it. It's not overproduced. It's not. It's just literally your life, and that's. I think that's why people have uh, become sort of like just yeah, sort of infatuated. I mean, some some guys have become <laughs> very infatuated. It's, very, it's like that's an understatement. Yeah, totally. We'll, we'll talk about some of that in a, in a bit. In a bit, but um, yeah, um, it's funny because na- nowadays like they say the top um, job choice that if you ask anyone under like 10, they want to be a YouTuber. And you've sort of just almost stumbled into it by accident, which mm-hmm. I find really like fascinating, but it's most, most people are trying to spend their whole life to do it. And you've, you've done it by like, sort of blowing up naturally, which I think is the best way. You've not been too formulaic with it, but also I remember you saying once a story about like the very, f- how it actually very first started is you, st- wasn't you doing like a live stream on, was it Reddit or something? Yeah. So, I uh, I was in college at the time and I actually hadn't practiced guitar, like actually sat down and practiced for a couple of months. And uh, I thought now's a great time to just sit and practice. And uh, I was actually on Reddit and there was this live stream feature. I was like, oh, cool, I'm going to go live and, pra- and uh, live stream my practice. And uh, like it got to about 30,000 people on that live stream at one point. I was like, what is going on? I was sat there in my pyjamas, yeah. like yeah. with my hair, a total mess, because I wasn't expect. I was expecting like five people to come on and just tell me that I'm crap. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that that has like 250K now. And that was, yeah, I'd say that was like the start of everything for me. So Yeah, that was like an important moment. It's funny, you, you could have done something totally different that night. You could have just been like, I'm going to like go and you know, make some pasta or something. But you're just like, I'm going to sit there and actually do this, <laughs> practice, live stream it. And then it's it's led to what where you are now. Yeah, it's so weird when you think about it. So anyone watching, what is the actual reality of being a YouTuber? It's quite a lot harder than it looks. Yeah. Um, Because once everything's edited down, it just looks kind of simple or even the videos don't look that long. But the work that goes into the guitar playing behind the scenes, like making sure you are always kind of up to the highest standard you can be at that time. Um, so first putting the work into the guitar work and then putting the work into the video, it's like two yep. separate things that you combine and uh, keeping both of those up to the quality that you want is actually kind of difficult. That's right. Well, we've been h- hanging out in Sweden. To, we've picked up this vintage um, Strat. That, I don't know if you just quickly show you the camera. I don't know if you guys can get that as a close-up or not, but we picked up this old Strat and um, we've been filming some content for it and I've literally realised how... Say if someone sees like a 10 minute video online, that can take you hours and hours to edit just yeah. for that 10 minutes. And it's like people sometimes think, oh, I'm just going to get a, you know, 
a camera and plonk it in front of your face and then there's a YouTube video, but there's a lot more work that goes into it and you seem to have mastered that process behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, I just, I like I like editing it because it's, to me, it's almost the process of storytelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you do it right, you, you kind of, it can be really nice in a way, um, but it yeah. is stressful at the same time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we had some funny moments like editing this time because we, we, we were editing on a train. We could just see each other laughing while we were editing it because it's just so many <laughs> stupid things going on. But yeah, yeah. So how, how are you liking Sweden? Is it How is it different to the, London? Um, well, first we went to Gothenburg, didn't we? That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's That's a lot less kind of busy and fast paced than London. It was really nice to just kind of have, have this take it easy vibe and just kind of chill and do whatever you want um and then we came to stockholm that actually yeah, actually has a similar vibe um <laughs> yeah me, me was like i want to get out of london uh and then so we take it to a place that's exactly like london <laughs> <laughs> stockholm's really cool and it's the overall vibe in sweden everyone's so chilled out and just like cool and they're accommodating and um yeah, yeah. We, we've met a few characters but <laughs> people actually like to talk to you on the street which is cool yeah i think sweden's been great to us we went to some guitar shops yesterday didn't we, we went to some like vintage guitar shops yeah, what, what do you, while we're here, what, what do you think to the, the Strat? The Strat, um, you know, it's just some some guitars you pick up and you just, you don't even vibe with it and you don't know what to play. But I was I was watching back the footage and it's like both of us just really gelled with that Strat. Yeah, it sort of excelled both of our playing, didn't it? It's right, like, yeah. like we never kind of didn't know what to play or was like, oh, it just, it just works really well. And actually just to see that guitar, it just, it's so... I don't even know. What's the word? It's Obviously, it's a vintage guitar, but it just has this perfect finish. Yeah, it doesn't. It's just like got this thing about it where it's like history. You can almost like feel and smell the history. It's like, um, and I mean, to be fair, we were going through like a, a 1960 Fender basement. I tell you what, that was quite an experience to hear Mimi cranking that up. Like, that was crazy. The whole shop was vibrating. It's like, <laughs> it's insane. You just recently picked up one of your dream guitars? Yes. Uh, I recently got a PRS Studio. Yeah. Um that's part of my um eighties fascination because it can do it so the studio model has like two mini humbuckers and then like a humbucker in the bridge. It means that like the guitar can be so versatile that I can stick to my blues that I love, like, you know, Steve Ray Vaughan and Hendrix and people like that and like some John Mayer. Um but I can also go to the humbucker in the bridge and then like do a bit of Dan Hoof and Steve Lukather and things like that and uh, honestly PRS is just I first played it in Tim's studio yeah oh my gosh I after I did that I knew I had to get one for myself because it was so I before that I was always kind of like a Fender girl yeah like because that's what my heroes kind of play like Hendrix and um, but no after I tried a PRS I was like I need one. Yeah, totally. And you went to the guitar gallery in Anderson's, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Pick that up, which was really cool. That's an experience in itself, isn't it? Definitely. It's like, I don't, I don't know if they rope it off to the general public, but I feel like they're a bit more protective about who goes in there. But Yeah, I think you just have to make an appointment. And then, uh, because yeah. they have like the two guys who are like really knowledgeable about every guitar in there. And then yeah. they're going to tell you like exactly um, what you might want to hear about your guitar that you're looking for. So, so what drew you to that exact PRSN? Um, the beautiful colour, obviously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but also, yeah, probably the pickup configuration, just because it's so versatile. It's like, I've heard it described as like the desert island guitar. Right, yeah. Just because you can you can do basically anything on it. How do you feel like gear is um, sort of relevant in 2022? Because it's almost become part of like your identity, hasn't it? Um, yeah. Like, if you're playing that PRS, it's making a statement to oh, a certain right. crowd of people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I didn't realise it was such a huge statement to buy a PRS, but, like, I was definitely told about it after I did it. They were like, wait, you got a PRS? Yeah. And you just went in and got it? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, definitely, like, brands kind of seem to define almost kind of who you are as an artist, which yeah. is it's quite interesting. Um it's all kind of part of the guitar culture which I actually really enjoy it um just being able something about just exploring different kinds of guitars and finding out the most you can about them and just 
it's it's so much more than just making music at that point. It's it's another hobby in in itself, just yeah. to explore guitars as they are. Yeah, some guy commented on uh, one of our videos yesterday and said, um, "This guy's just buying a guitar so he doesn't have to face the reality that he needs to practice more." <laughs> and I'm like, that's so true though. I feel like sometimes you do just want to sit online on reverb at night and just like look at guitars, and it's be- it's more fun than practicing, but. Uh, you know, you've got to, you've got to put the practice into, but it's like I say, it's a separate thing. It's almost like a totally separate industry from actually practicing and trying to get better, and you know, worrying about the business side of it. But yeah, yeah. Um, talking talking of some of the comments we get, we've had a good laugh this last week. Literally going through some of our messages and just looking at the absolute <laughs> ridiculousness that we both get. Um, for some reason, even if you're just being yourself, sat there with a guitar in a jumper, whatever, you still get this strange reaction of like polarization like people are literally getting into wars over you and, I, and it's what why why do you think that is um i honestly don't know i seem to bring out something in people whether that's like love or admiration like not in a weird way but no, yeah no yeah like well, just, no, so some, some of them are in a weird, weird way weird way from what <laughs> i've seen but i just mean in general like support but i also seem to bring out like the worst in some people also because the style of music I like to play and guitar culture in itself, it lends itself to kind of uh, the older generations and a yeah. lot of males. And uh, sorry to say this, but a lot of you are stuck in your old ways. <laughs> oh. And uh, I actually don't appreciate it. It's you know, fine. <laughs> well, if you look at my demographic on YouTube, it's 99.99% male. And then I think the one person watching it is my grandma or something. Like that's a, <laughs> as a woman. So I feel like it's... Yeah, and you've got the same, haven't you? It's like I mean, the, there's so much misogyny in my comments section. It's actually um, kind of depressing. How do you deal with that? Um, you know, I've asked my friends like, "What, what should I do?" Um, and they were just like, y- "You're going to have to deal with this probably for the rest of your career." Mm. Um, it's just that's just how it is at the moment. Maybe things will change, but it's not up to. It's not your fault. It's not up to yeah. you to try and change yourself to deal with it um it's just kind of uh doing your best to not listen to them and just take note of the positive ones rather than the like polarizing kind of like people who just hate the fact that you exist yeah (laughs) yeah yeah well i mean i was saying to you yesterday like uh something that i heard recently was like be worried that the you know the day that they actually stop talking about you because you want to be relevant and you are always relevant because you're such well one because you're an amazing guitar player but also you do get people talking no matter what it's like even if you just do i don't know just a, whatever people just are drawn to you it's it's strange how like yeah it's and i've seen some weird things in the, in the comments and uh, and messages in the last week like i feel like i need therapy after this <laughs> this week so what would you say is a great sort of like foundational tip for someone just starting out where should they where should they start like a beginner yeah total beginner um Honestly, get a teacher, um, just because I feel like having a teacher in that first year is what saved me from... It, it, it allowed me to start out with having my technique right, because when you're... You can, you can learn at home from videos and songs, but there's no one to say, oh, hey, you should probably work on your technique there. It's a, you're doing that a bit wrong. You're not holding your pick right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what my guitar teacher told me back in the day, actually. Back in the day, it was like six years ago. <laughs> when, I, when I was 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I always made the argument. I was like, I don't want to use a pick. He was like, you probably should learn how to use a pick. Yeah. Um, I had those same things. I, I used to play um, with two fingers, which is really weird. There's actually a video of, um, I've got it on my phone. I'll show you later. It's like, I'm playing Mary Had a Little Lamb by Stevie. And I'm just like doing this weird technique. It's so strange. <laughs> and also, some bad habits, as we were talking about before, I never actually have got out of. So I feel like if I had a teacher at that time, they would have been like, yeah, Chris, you need to stop doing this. You're What are you doing? A bit of like an accountability partner, someone to say, do this by next week, otherwise I'll beat you up. Or you know, It's like you have that person just saying like, um, get on with it. And I feel like that's important for the start, isn't it? Exactly. You, you can also reach a stage where you feel like, oh, I can, like I have the technique to play what I want to play now. Like, where do I go next? Yeah. Kind of thing. I feel that's one of the main problems that guitar players face is it's like, they get stuck in a rut, don't they? Even massive, mm. massively successful guitar players, I see them sometimes saying, "Oh, I've just I've hit a lull. Don't know how to like get out of it." And maybe having a teacher to show you some fresh things will get you out of that. They'll probably be able to pick out something that you could definitely improve on. So, how long have you actually been playing now? 
I think it's about six years now. Yeah, that's, that's quite a long time, isn't it? Of your p- big portion of your life to actually like dedicate to something, and and you can't see yourself doing anything else ever. No, it's just Is it this or nothing. <laughs> it's all I ever wanted to do, really. Like I just didn't even try at anything else at school, or and this is what I studied at college. So a lot of people that I see now are like, like that are successful. What are their co- like common traits? I keep seeing is they actually did really bad at school. Mm. It's funny. I just and I feel like you're part of that cl- club oh, as well. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm the same. I'm the same though. I was like, I just I wanted to. I used to race home just so I could play Steve Ray Vaughan on my guitar. Yeah, you know, it's just, yeah. Same. It's just it, I'd rather do that than be that extra bit better at algebra. You know. I think the thing is when I enjoy something, I get really obsessive about it. Yeah. I, I like. I don't let it go. Yeah. Um. And it's kind of been that way for a long time. There's also phases of that. Like I'll go through a phase where I don't even want to play guitar that much, but then the next moment I know it's all I want to do. Yeah. Like every second. And uh, I think I like it that way because it's just, you kind of, you get to, f- it's almost like you're picking it up for the first time again. You recently moved from Lincoln to London yeah. in the UK. Yeah, What's yeah. the vibe like in London? Uh, it's, it's very different from Lincoln. Yeah. Um, it's so... London's like a huge playground. Just, it's amazing. There's You could never get bored, but it's also... When I moved there, a lot of people told me, like, be careful because, like, it, it can, like, it can do damage to you. Like, young people get driven out of there. I, I totally, I get that now because it's, like, there's so much material... Is it materialism? Everywhere there's ads, like, thrown in your face. And yeah, it's, yeah. But it's, it's not, I don't know if it's... I don't know if it's necessarily London itself. It's just that big city vibe. Yeah. Um, but I love it for everything that it is. You know, I just, I can't, I can't imagine living anywhere else right now. Yeah. Um, and it's strange because I moved to London to kind of meet other musicians that I might want to play with or maybe start a band or maybe just do some recording together. Um, I have met a couple and I've gone to jams and stuff, but it's also that step that I moved from Lincoln and then out to London by myself, it almost sent this, like, signal out to people that I, I was trying to take it seriously. Mm. Like, even though I knew that... Um, it's intention, isn't it? it? It allowed, like, me to show that to people. And, that, and it's weird because moving to London allowed me to meet, like, Tim in L.A. Yeah. And, like, one of my friends, Sean, who's from Florida. Yeah. And now I have, like, this network of people who are just all over the world kind of thing and it's the best and you say that sort of stemmed from going to london definitely yeah i feel like the perception you portray online is quite important like if i was still living in my mum's basement it's like no one's going to care like about what i've got to say because it's just you know you see your mum walking in to give you your dinner it's like (laughs) sorry yeah so um but that's awesome i feel like london uh is it's definitely in the uk is the place to be for music still isn't it there's still like yeah like say cool jam nights would you say you need to actually be in london nowadays to be a successful musician or could you could you do it elsewhere um it can well because everything about this world is so remote nowadays like you don't need to go to a studio to record you just need a laptop and maybe a couple of friends if if you're doing it that way but you can also just do it by yourself yeah um you could do everything remotely from wherever you want really yeah totally yeah um but it depends what you're kind of doing. If you if you, if you want to do a gig and stuff, you're probably better off in a bigger city like London. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy nowadays how like the whole online world has just been like globalized into this. Like you can just go on Instagram, message whoever you, you got. But we were saying the other day actually, weren't we? Like how because it's given you that access to anyone and everyone. Uh, that's amazing. But on the flip side, everyone's got that same access. So it's almost right. like it's weird. It's all moved like that. Who would you say are like your top three like guitarists that you've actually inspired you to be where you are now? Uh, Hendrix, Steve Ray Vaughan. And My guys. <laughs> John Mayer. Yeah. So definitely in like the first five years, I spent a lot of it trying to emulate them and learning their songs, their licks, um, how to solo from them. Um, but recently I've kind of taken, like, I always wanted to be kind of a studio musician, musician, but I didn't try to emulate studio players, but now I've kind of taken a turn and it's like, for example, Dan Huff, who's also like this incredibly successful session guitarist, well, he's a producer now as well, but, um, like he's one of my favorite session guitarists of the eighties and I'm trying to like 
emulate the way he worked for a song. Rather than steal his licks and everything that he did, I'm trying to emulate his mindset and his philosophy. Yeah, that's like one of the key secrets to being like a, a session player. Not not trying to show how good you are. You're literally putting your part to make the song better. Even if it's like the simplest part. Yeah, sometimes, I mean, I've heard this. I've heard guys being paid like £5,000 to go into a studio, play literally one note, and the producer's like, that's what we needed. And then they walk out, they've got five grand in their back pocket. It's like, it's a weird world, but if you're actually adding value to the song in that way, that's where, that's what your job is. It's not about, look how good I am at guitar. So that's cool that you've got that mindset. It's quite rare. I feel like the not many guitar players have that. Uh, most guitar players are like, I want to be the best, the biggest, like, I want to play fastest. It's like, but you're not like that. No, I, I have some like competitiveness as as well about it. I feel like that's kind of built into guitar players. Yeah, I feel I feel like um, you're you're quite analytical though, and like, which is good for like you like to look at different metrics and think, okay, I'm going to get better like that. And you're quite um, astute to details, which is good. And I think it's something that's actually helped you get where you are. Yeah, I mean, I look back at my videos from like a year ago, and I'm like, Jesus, that was awful. Yeah, Who me let too. Me I, upload that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I actually watched an old one of mine recently, and I was like. I would, yeah, I wanted to absolutely just jump out the window. It's, like, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to see, like, the progression, though, because sometimes it feels like, oh, I feel like I haven't progressed in ages, but then you look back at old stuff and it's like, what? Uh. Yeah. Okay, so we were talking before about, like, some tips for beginners. What what would you say is, like, a your top three tips for guitarists that are, you know, trying to get better, like, in the sort of blues rock sort of niche? Start playing in a band, even if it's, like, for example, my, my first band was, like, in school. Mm. and none of us well my bandmates like one of them was just my best friend who didn't even take a big interest in music but she was like she wanted something to she wanted a hobby so she took up drums and we just like formed a band with this other singer and we were all interested in different music but just having a band that would be willing to play like Pride and Joy by Stevie Ray Vaughan just allowed me to like experience it within context playing that so I feel like joining a band is going to help you understand the dynamic of a guitar player totally yeah and you can you can see some guys on instagram maybe and they're they're maybe like playing to a metronome too much and it's they lose the feel but when you play with a musician you get that actual human exactly yeah don't just learn the pentatonic scale actually learn how to phrase with it or shall go at me now (laughs) (laughs) but i feel like i did that for so long like i just play the scale like up and down just things like bending and just like articulation can add so much to something that's quite a basic scale for me listening to a bunch of different like jazz players and different blues players and even just really soulful like slide players that gets you out of that box of like being a pentatonic Mm. you know shredder or whatever it's like you get that extra feeling in there and i feel that's that's what differentiates a good guitarist to a bad guitarist in my opinion like what 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 is it for you if you listen to a guitarist and you're like i don't like that and i don't vibe with it what is that thing that makes you not like it? Um, to be honest, I, I don't like listening to a lot of kind of virtuoso guitarists. Yeah. Just because, I mean, their technique is so amazing and it's like admirable and like I definitely support them in that way, but I, I never like to sit down and listen to a virtu- virtuoso guitarist. Yeah, that um, makes sense. This is something that I'm doing, like learn the harmony behind what you're doing and like the theory because I thought I had a pretty good grasp on music theory but it's actually like having that theory and then applying it to the guitar and like even like I like to play keyboards sometimes like I like synths and just being able to translate what you can do on the guitar to other instruments and so then you can create your own tracks and stuff and you can play to it and uh, it's really important like if you're actually making your own music. Totally that's, that's awesome. This the most important part of the show. We need to talk about guitar pedals. Oh it's, god, <laughs> it's got got to do it. It's uh, it's one of the most crazy industries right now. Like you go on Instagram, everyone's just talking about pedals. It's like, thankfully, we're involved in it at this time in history because I feel like 10, 20 years back, no one would have cared about pedals. They just threw a tube screamer in their bag, and that's that's job done. But nowadays, there's so many brands out there. Where do you start in trying to actually narrow down? A guitar pedal brand to use their pedals by because it's just so many for me it's i think it's when it comes to pedals it's kind of less about brand and more about what the pedal can actually do um like i feel like guitars are kind of a lot of about the brand but f- for me pedals is about like for example your pedals i fell in love with the texan triangle because it actually allowed me to get that feel and sound of stevie ray vaughan 
Um, like I didn't even know of pedal upon the name at that time. Mm. Um, and then a lot of the pedals I get are just based on what I've seen my favorite guitarists use. Yeah. But yeah, so like the Tube Screamer and my Aquapus Delay, like that's John Mayer. And uh, you actually gave me a rat distortion recently. That's yeah, good. to help to help your clean amp, wasn't it? Because yeah. the clean amp was too clean <laughs> for yeah. your new 80s You did that endeavor. distortion. Yeah. Um, I feel like a rat would be like a... It's nasty though, isn't it? It's like... I love it though. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's great. Cool. Um, and then I have a chorus pedal, the boss one. That's I'll give you that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just like giving you all my pedals. Just giving me all... <laughs> <laughs> that's me trying to get the 80s sound as well. Yeah. Um... That's cool. So when you're saying about like the guitar brands having, like, do you feel like you have to connect with the ethos behind the brand if you want to buy a guitar? Yeah, that, that's important to me. Um, just branding is, I feel like you said, when, when you have a guitar, it's almost a statement mm. um, when you're playing it. So that's that's quite important to me. So would you buy like a Gibson, for example? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, no comment. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, nice. No, so I feel like that's what I'm trying to do with pedal porn sometimes. I'm trying to like actually build a brand and a community of people that all share the same, not just share the same view, but they all are just part of something that like it's almost like a little community, you know? Yeah, you, you're doing that really well. Like, I feel like you've got all like the Steve Ray Vaughan and the Hendrix kind of enthusiasts and you've kind of built something out of it, you know? That's cool. I, I mean, it's like, it's, um, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. And it's, yeah, certainly trying with it, but it's, um, yeah, it's always hard. It's like just trying to find a little way through. That's what everyone's been saying to me. So, well, we've been in Sweden. Everyone's like, Chris, what's your like USP of like trying to get through the market? And I'm just like, it's um, Stevie Hendrix, Old Strats. Um. You've made it really simple though as well. Like you, you look at your pedals and maybe you read one sentence about it and you know exactly what they're for. Yeah. You know the kind of person that's going to want them and you know if that person is you. I think that's what really pushes people towards you because the harder you make your pedals mm. and gear to understand, like the less people are going to be interested in it. Totally. We, we were in a shop yesterday and we've got our good friend, Emmanuel Hedberg. He was a uh, Swedish guitarist. He was with us um, yesterday and literally um, he was sat on the amp trying to get a sound out of the, while, while he was playing it. And he couldn't even, um, so, sorry to um, out, out him like this, but he couldn't actually... <laughs> work out how to even turn the volume up because it's that complicated because <laughs> it's that complicated there's like 50 vo- like 50 knobs on it yeah and um, like Emmanuel's like just twisting them on he's like no nothing's happening and we're like we just want a volume control do you know what I mean it's like exactly like yeah. people are going to be put off by that obviously if they spend time with it they might figure oh actually I really like the sound but like it's about that immediate impression yeah totally yeah yeah and like like you said about the NAM thing like if you go to a booth at NAM, it should be um in fact, one of my like business mentors told me like if you can't describe your product definition within ten words, you've got the wrong product. You need to be able to like say it really snappily. And that's the same with Nam. If you go to a booth, you want to see something that's easily accessible, not like you've got to read ten instructions. In fact, anything. This is actually a controversial thing to say, but any gear that comes with an instruction manual is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's why I don't even include instruction manuals without pedals because it's like there's a volume and a fuzz. Work out how to use it. Get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's, like, that's my, my take on it. <laughs> okay, so yesterday you were saying um, one of your like ultimate dreams would actually to have your own home studio. Yeah, like um, I'm going to like be building up over time. Um, I want to be able to have a studio that I can, because, okay, I had this conversation with Tim Pierce after NAM and he was like, you know, I know the session world that you wish that you want to be a part of and he's like it's, it's very different now it's all it, it's kind of remote like you've seen my home studio because it's just not how it was like in the 80s obviously when you would go to these professional studios and so from that I'm like okay so part of my endeavor needs to be that over time I need to build up my own studio and with that I can actually do videos of me doing a session which people will probably get things out of it because it's it's crafting a song, which I find that really, like, really enjoyable just to see. And um, at the same time, whoever I might be working with is going to get that promotion out of the video for yeah. their song. It's like a triple whammy, isn't it? It's a win-win. To wrap this up, we're going to do this like little little game. Uh, it's like a word association game. Okay, so I'm going to tell you ten different words. I want you to tell me like the first thing that comes into your mind. Like it doesn't have to be one word, but a very small phrase or one word. So Hendrix. Strap. Oh, that was fast. I feel like I thought he was going to be taking a while for the Vintage Strats. That's the next one. Yeah. Wait, what? That was the next one. Yeah, Vintage oh. Strats. 
Um, Steve Ray Vaughan. Okay. Oh no, this is crazy. The no. next one is Steve Ray Vaughan. No. You're literally like, this is this seems um, pre-planned. His hat with like a feather on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a tail. Oh, okay. okay. Wait. By the way, can you guess the next one? Because uh, if you throw this out, I'm gonna no, I'm gonna have to show the camera. Like, I can't. Uh, you, okay. Right. Um, the next one is YouTube. Um. Oh gosh. Uh, music. I don't know. Cool. John Mayer. Um, Silver Sky. Nice. Uh, pedal porn. <laughs> hub. <laughs> hub. Pedal porn. Hub. Let's go. Um, uh, social media. Uh, why would you throw this at me? <laughs> um, it's a dream and a nightmare. Ah, I like it. Okay. Uh, PRS. Ooh. Blue. <laughs> I can't stop forgetting. <laughs> yeah. Um Perfection. Oh. Okay, two that's two more. Um Okay. Uh money and music. Like making money with music. Jesus. Um nigh impossible. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay, the last one. Mimi Sounds Legacy. What? <laughs> <laughs> for for in the big Getting the deep questions in. Stop trying to throw me into an existential crisis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God. I should take it. <laughs> Sip in the water. I'm too young for this question. <laughs> yeah. No, you're not getting out of it. Mimi sounds legacy. Let's yeah. go. Good, hopefully. Good. <laughs> good. That's, that's such an understatement. Like on your gravestone, Mimi sounds good. <laughs> so, okay, that's cool. But um, right, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us. Uh, we're going to go and maybe check out some like other guitar shops now. And uh, Yeah, that was the first ever Pedal Porn podcast. You heard it here first. Um, thanks so much for watching, guys. Definitely check out Mimi's social media pages. Where can we Where can we find you? Just Mimi Sounds on like Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Awesome. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll catch you on the next one, and cheers. What? Hey! <laughs> <laughs>